chapter 12, Numbers chapter 12, we're going to start reading verses 1 through 15 this morning, Numbers chapter 12, verses 1 through 15, and once you have found that, go over to Deuteronomy chapter 24, Deuteronomy chapter 24, hold your finger in Deuteronomy and just go right back to Numbers chapter 12, and that's where we will start out this morning. Everyone standing as we read the Word of God, Numbers chapter 12. We're going to read verses 1 through 15 this morning. If you can give me just a little bit more monitor, if you would. Numbers chapter 12 and verses 1 through 15. If you have it, give me a good amen. Amen. All right, that wasn't good enough. If you have it, give a good amen. Amen. The Bible says in verse 1, And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. For he had married an Ethiopian woman. And they said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. And the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses and unto Aaron and unto Miriam, Come out, ye three, unto unto the tabernacle of the congregation. And they three came out. And the Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forth. And he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all of mine house. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently and not in dark speeches. And the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore, then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them. That's against um, Aaron and Miriam. It was kindled against them, and he departed. And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle. And behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said unto Moses, Alas, my Lord, I beseech thee, lay not the sin upon us, wherein we have done foolishly, and wherein we have sinned. Let her not be as one, uh, as one dead, of whom the flesh is half consumed when he cometh out of his mother's womb. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, Heal her now, O God, I beseech thee. And the Lord said unto Moses, If her father had but spit in her face, should she not be ashamed seven days? Let her be shut out from the camp seven days. And after that, let her be received in again. And Miriam was shut out from the camp seven days, and the people journeyed not till Miriam was brought in again. Now I want you to go to Deuteronomy chapter 24. Deuteronomy chapter 24 and verse 9. Deuteronomy 24 and verse 9. The scripture says in verse 9, Remember what the Lord thy God did unto Miriam by the way, after that ye were come forth out of the land of Egypt. I was reading verse 9. I've read these verses, good night, at least a couple hundred times. And something jumped out in this verse. It's right there. I've never seen it. But it just jumped out, as obvious as the day is long. I want you to listen to the sermon this morning from the beginning to the end. That means, Brother Moore, you cannot take a nap at the end of the service. I want you to listen from the beginning to the end. Because the beginning, I'm going to talk about what we already know. But at the end, I want to show you what God showed me that I truly believe will be a help to everybody under my voice if you listen to me. I want to just speak on, the, on those two words, remember Miriam. Remember Miriam. Father, I know how excited I was about this truth when you showed it to me. Even this week as I was preaching out, I was talking to the pastor who I was preaching with and about this truth and how excited I was about it. And I was telling him about it and he got excited because, Lord, it is, you're an amazing God. That, Lord, you put those two words in there and then our fleshliness keeps us from seeing 
I think a truth that everybody needs to understand. Lord, let me help your people, please. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. For whatever reason, Miriam and Aaron became critical of Moses, the man of God. Figure that one out. I've never understood these two. I mean, his brother and sister, I, I, I can't understand it. Moses was the one that God spoke to face to face. Moses was the one who God used to lead him through the middle of the Red Sea. Moses was the one who came to Pharaoh and, th and, 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 and the plagues came down upon the land of Egypt. Moses was that mouthpiece. Moses was that representative of God. No doubt in anyone's mind that the hand of God rested upon Moses. Moses was that man that even to this day we look back to and we see the life of Moses. And everybody, we look at Moses and his ability to lead. We look at Moses and his closeness to God. We look at Moses and we see that walk with God that he had in every part maybe of Moses' life, but maybe one little instance in his life that we all look at and say, wow, if I could just have that on my life. And yet these two people looked at Moses and it wasn't the enemies. It was those who were right next to him. It was those who should have been they, they knew God was on his life. They knew that God was doing something through him. Yet they're the ones that began to criticize. And they're the ones that began to murmur behind him. And they're the ones that began to say to themselves, huh, does he think he's the only one that God can speak to? Does he think God can't speak to? You know what I'm talking about. And every preacher's kid has been there, and every preacher's kid has watched people talk about their dad that way. And anybody that's ever been in the ministry has heard those, those murmurings among God's people as certain people begin to get a little bit filled with pride, and they forget. Sometimes they're eating off the crumbs of the blessing of the man of God. It's not They don't get the crumbs because of themselves. They're getting the crumbs because of the men of God that stood behind the pulpit and preached the word of God. And they're just enjoying the benefits of what God is doing. Yet these two begin their disloyal comments and their disloyal acts. The accusation that they threw at Moses is interesting. It was simply a cover-up for the real reason. The accusation was, he's taken too much upon him. The accusation was, um, can't God speak through us? The real reason was, according to the scriptures, they didn't like that he married who he married. They didn't like that he married an Ethiopian woman. They thought that he had no business leading the nation because he had married this woman. That was the real reason of why they began to murmur. And as is always the case, when someone criticizes, listen to me, ladies and gentlemen, there's another reason behind the criticism. And you always have to remember, don't get caught up in the criticism because there's another agenda that they're covering up underneath that they don't want you to see. And that's why it's always dangerous to get in this idea that I'm going to attack the man of God and show him who I am. Let me tell you something, and I'm not just speaking for me. I'm speaking for every man of God in the whole world. When you start going against the man of God, you now are on the wrong side of God because God will always defend the man of God. Isn't it interesting that, that Moses, Bible says, was a, was a meek man. When they begin to criticize Moses didn't even defend himself. He kind of stepped back. And as most good men of God will do, they just kind of say, well, the Lord will take care of it. But Moses didn't expect God to take care of it the way he did. God came down. God began to speak, and the jealousy began to come out, and the finger pointing that they had began to be revealed as, as God was pointing out why they did this. And, and, and all of a sudden, they, as, they, as it began to come out, God came out and exposed the hypocrisy of Aaron and Miriam. What's interesting to me is if you look at verse 10, it says, actually verse 9, it says, And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them. And he departed. Who's that he? God. And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle. Hold on. 
That cloud was an evidence of whose presence? God's. You get a church that's filled with criticism, you're going to find a church that's absence of God's presence. Let me say it one more time. You get a church that's filled with criticism, you'll find a church that's absent, that, that God's presence is absent. Listen to me. If, we, if this church starts pointing its fingers at everybody else, God will have no part of that. That's not our job. Our job is to go out and keep people out of hell. Our job is to bring the lost to church. Our job is to grow people and let them get back out. It's not my job to do God's job. It's God's job to do his own job. And if we're not careful, we're gonna, we'll fall into the same trap that Moses and Aaron found themselves in. Boy, I've watched a lot of people that God used, but they began to get critical, and God's presence just kind of backed off. You know what my biggest fear for Maranatha Baptist Church? Is that the newness of Alan Domley wears off, and the critical spirit starts setting in, and the soul stop being saved, and the baptistry water stop being used. And the blessings that God has given us the past few months begin to begin to subside, and we just become the average nominal church. You say, Brother Donnelly, do we have a problem? No, we don't. I'm just saying, I don't want us to ever get there. I want God to continue to bless. Oh, I've got dreams so big. Hmm. That would scare you. God didn't give us four and a half acres. To be vacant. Do we need to give a chill pill just a little bit? God gave us this place and God gave us this property for a reason. And I believe with all my heart the best days of Maranatha Baptist Church are ahead. But I don't want this church to ever get to that point that our critical spirit causes God to move off. Our text verse says, though, it says, remember, in verse De De Deuteronomy 24, 9, remember what the Lord thy God did unto Miriam, by the way, after that ye were come forth out of the land of Egypt. This is all introduction. We're not in the sermon yet, so just listen in. You see, God, was, he says, remember Miriam. Get this. Sin does have consequences. You can't live in sin and expect not God not to do it. I get tired of this crowd out there, this, this um, hyper grace crowd that says, well, all of our sins have been paid. God doesn't, God doesn't, you know, the Christian doesn't have to worry about God judging sin. Okay, go rob a bank and tell them when you stand before the judge, I'm, my, my sins are under the blood. See what that judge says. There's still consequences. Hey, go drive down Rockwell Avenue, go about 75 miles an hour through, through Bethany, and when the policeman pulls you over, say, well, we're under grace. There's still consequences to sin. Whether you're saved or not, there's always consequences. Yes, our sins have been paid, but listen to me. You can't go into sin and expect the consequences not to be there. Listen, you can't play in sin and expect God not to see it. Illustration. Remember David? David, that great king, that man that God was called the man after God's own heart, yet he went and committed adultery, thought he hid it from everyone, but God saw and God went to Nathan and said, Nathan, you need to go to David and tell him that God is not happy with him. And Nathan went and pointed that old finger at the man of, at the, at the king and said, thou art the man. And David became, he, he was crushed that, he, that his sin had brought a reproach to God. Why? Sin has consequences. You can't play in sin. I think of Samson thought he could play in sin and he played for a while, but the sin caught up. Doesn't matter how powerful you are. Doesn't matter how talented you are. Doesn't matter what you have inside your life you play in sin and God says there's consequences to that sin God says hey remember Miriam Achan thought he could hide his sin but God revealed it you see the display of your sin is never the core of your sin for instance listen the, what we saw in, in Moses and Iriam was only the symptom of the real cause. 
I often tell people this, when you have bitterness, it's not that that bitterness is only a symptom of a heart issue. And when someone's cold towards the things of God, it's a symptom that their heart is worldly. When someone's jealous of others, it's a symptom that they're too lazy to do the work themselves. When someone's critical of others, it's a symptom. The core is they know they should be doing it, so the only way they can justify it is to blame somebody else because they, if they could get them to stop, then their, uh, their works and their actions won't make them feel bad. Now, that was all introduction. Here comes the sermon. God says, Remember what the Lord thy God did unto Miriam, by the way. I was reading that verse, and all of a sudden, I remembered. God didn't just strike Miriam with leprosy. Follow me. Here's the lesson. But he was also merciful enough to take the leprosy away. I began to think about that. The God that judged sin said, it's okay, I still have mercy on the other side. Your past may have been bad, and God's always a merciful God, and God's anger against sin doesn't stop him from being merciful to the repentant sinner. I can come through this auditorium this morning and I can talk to people this morning as I've gotten to know many of you. Some of you, you've let your past kind of beat you up way too much. You keep on going back to the same thing because you're living in your past. May I tell you, doesn't matter how, how low sin has brought you. May I remind you that God's mercy and God's grace can reach down to the miry clay of where sin has brought you and bring you up out of that miry clay and can set your feet on a rock and establish your goings again. And the God that judges sin is also a God who's a merciful sin who says, I can still use you in spite of what you've done in the past. Just because God judged you doesn't mean that God won't be merciful to you. God's anger, I like to say this, God's anger never overwhelms his mercy. As great as God's anger is, his mercy is greater. Did you get that? As, as angry as God can get, his mercy is so much greater. God judged Samson, but the hair of his head began to grow again. No, Brother Dion, that is not your life verse. Listen to me. Doesn't matter how deep you go. Oh, let me tell you something. I'm glad in the book of Corinthians when God begins to go through a bunch of things that those in in the church of Corinth had done. He said, and such were some of you. You see, you did that. You did the bad in the past. Such were some of you. Well, what made them, what was that? What was that? What changed that? The mercy of God. What changed that? The grace of God. What changed it all? Let me tell you, thank God for the mercy of God. That doesn't matter what you've done in the past. God's mercy says, listen, my mercy doesn't live in the past. My mercy is a present tense mercy that can use you in the present. May I tell you this morning, may I ask you this morning to say, may I say this, stop letting your past be the weight that prevents God from using you in the present and in the future. Some of you, you carry that weight of guilt. You've come to God, how many times have you come to God at this altar? You say, God, I, I wish I'd have never done that. God, I, I wish I, 
I wish I'd have changed that decision. If I could have just changed. And, and, and you go back to that first decision that led down to that path. In, you, in your mind, in your heart, you go back. You say, if I could just go back to that one point and stop that one decision, all of this could have been avoided, but, I, but, but it can't be. It's done. May I tell you, there's the mercy of God that can reach to right where you are right now. That mercy of God says, okay, you've done that in the past, but God said, that's done. You've already gotten right with me. Stop letting it hold you back. Stop carrying that weight on your shoulder. I've done this. I've done this. I've done this. Listen to me. When you read this book right here, you're going to find there's a lot of people that had a past, but thank God, God was merciful enough to use them. Why? Because God's a merciful God. That's why. Peter was a cursing sailor and a quitting disciple, but God was merciful. Forty days later, he was standing on the day of Pentecost. David was an adulterer and put a contract on someone's life. Had him killed, but God was merciful. It was after that great sin, Psalm 51, maybe one of the greatest psalms that almost everybody knows about, that God used him to pen the Psalm 51. Why? Because I think that Psalm 51 is just the epitome of God's greatness, of his mercy, that no matter how deep you've gone in sin, the mercy of God is greater than that sin can ever bring you. And God's mercy is great enough to do the great things in your life if you just not let the weight pull you down. Think of Moses. Killed some of his bare hands. He was saved, by the way, at that point. Spent 40 years wandering, wasting his life in the wilderness. But then God called again. Moses got up from the wandering lifestyle. Stood up and said, okay, God, if you, I don't know if anybody would actually follow me. What if they bring up the past and God stopped them and, and didn't, let them, didn't let them talk about the past? God, again, reminded them of his power. Why? Because God can always remind you of his power. If you stop laying in the past and bringing up the past yourself and beating up yourself, there's a God in heaven that has shown you enough power. Listen to me. Why don't you understand that God's power to forgive is great enough to help you? As bad as your past may be, it's only a fraction of how bright God's mercy can make your future. The Apostle Paul, mass murderer, killed Christians by the hundreds. Yet God's mercy was great enough to save his soul, to give him a new future. God's mercy was great enough to help a man to turn from being a mass murderer to being a mass lifesaver. God's mercy. God's mercy. When I travel around the country, people ask me, what's your church like? I say, well, we're all just a bunch of blue-collar, it's a multicultural church people. We're not perfect. Many of us have a past, but our future's bright. Why? God's mercy. I'd take this crowd right here over the self-righteous crowd thinks they're better than everyone else, who maybe kind of overlooks the, what they call, the, 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 they, they think what we've done is big sin. Let me tell you something. I look at this church right now, and I see a church that 
Yes, some of you, you, you have some things you're ashamed of, but it's time you stop letting the past beat you up and understand the mercy of God and say, okay, as angry as God was, his mercy was that much greater. Remember Miriam. Oh, it's easy to remember the first part of Miriam, isn't it? It takes character to see the other side. It takes character to see the side where God's mercy took the leprosy away and God still used her in her life. Her life was not done. Why? God's a merciful God. Amen. Let me give you a few applications and we'll be done. Application number one, sin's consequences are great, are a great reminder of what, of what to avoid. Sin's consequences are a great reminder of what to avoid. Listen to me. Remember, Miriam, there's consequences to sin. Some of you, been, some of you, go, you come here every Sunday morning. I'm glad you're here, but stop playing in your sin. Because God's Spirit will not always strive with man. God, time after time after time, tried to get Samson to wake up before God had to send his judgment. Sent a lion. He didn't listen to the lion. Sent the, 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 the enemy that surrounded the city where he slept, but that didn't wake him up. Sent time after time people that God would say, Samson, wake up, Samson, wake up, Samson, wake up. And Samson kept on going and doing the same thing over and over and over again. May I just say right now, as we remember Miriam, sin's consequences are a great reminder of what to avoid. You see that others have gone through the consequences of sin. Hey, may I tell you this morning, you better understand you're not bigger than anyone else. At best, we're all flesh. If you don't believe me, don't use deodorant for a few days. <laughs> You'll remember your flesh. Come on now. Your armpits don't smell like roses. Say, so how do you know? Because your wife told me. Your feet aren't the second coming of Jesus Christ. Come on now. Listen. Sin's, sin's consequences are real. I hate it. That good people fall to sin. I hate it to see sin... Rave its hand and say, I, I got him. I got him. I've seen it happen so many times to people I love. And I never rejoice. It always hurts me. And I don't understand it when people are so arrogant to want to talk about somebody else's sins. I, I don't understand that. Application number two, get up and move on. Get up! Move on. Listen to me. God's mercy is not for the dormant believer. Get this. God's mercy starts when you get up. You lie there and wallow in the mire of your sin and God's mercy is there and it's, it's, he's, he's waiting to help you, but you got to get up. You have to get up. You've wallowed long enough in what you've done. It's time to get up. It's time to get up. 
And stop using that as your excuse to do what you're doing right now. Get up! Because God's mercy is being wasted while you lay there. Application number three. Let mercy be a big part of your Christian toolbox. What do you mean by that, preacher? Why don't you who've not yet fallen be willing to move on from another's past? You know what I hate? I hate arrogant Christians that constantly say, oh, they can't be used. They did this 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years. I got a question for you. Why is it that somebody can get saved from the same past, but they're okay to be used, but a believer has fallen and they're now not okay? What's the difference? What's the difference? Why are we so forgiving of someone who is lost? Oh, I'm glad the lost have a past that people say, okay, let's move on. But why can't we do that with our own? I'm sorry, you can't do that. You know, you're a dirty scoundrel. You know what you did. He's got to sit there in a pew and rot. No, sir. Not with this preacher. Go ahead, those who want to criticize me for that. Go ahead. I'll be on the side. I'll be on the sideline cheering the ones who are getting back up, dusting themselves off, showing the world the mercy and the grace of God. And I'll stand with them. I'll let them shoot their arrows and say, "Ah, oh, you're 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 going to stand with sinners." Yes, sir. Why our Savior stood with them. I'll stand with everyone. That they, may, they may stumble along the way, but I'm on your side. I want to cheer you along and say, hey, 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 it's not done. It's not done. Amen. Application number four. God's mercy in restoring the fallen is a display of the greatness of of God's grace. God's mercy in restoring the fallen is a display of the greatness of God's grace. You want to show the world how great God is? Get up. Yeah, I've been where you are, but God was merciful to me. God was gracious to me. It's a display of God's mercy and grace. When someone gets up and God begins to use them again. All the world can do is look at them and say, there's something different about their God. Because their God is willing to use them after they've done X. <laughs> yeah. And if all I have here at Maranatha Baptist Church are a bunch of people who have X beside their name because of sin that has touched them. I want to be able to say to the world, say, listen, yes, we may not have a perfect past, but who does? But what I want you to see is the grace of God. How many of you this morning, and I won't do this, I was I think of Brother Dickerson, I hate to talk to about you, but I remember when, you, when I first became pastor, before he got saved, he had a pretty rough life, I think. But I look at Brother Dickerson, I see the grace of God. I 
I see God's mercy right there. I say, praise God. Praise God, brother. One of our deacons. Good man. Faithful for years. God's grace. God's mercy. Are you wasting God's mercy this morning? Let me remind you of one person. Let me give you two words our Savior said. Remember Miriam. Oh, 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 before you, before you may remember her. We all can remember the first part. Let's remember the second part. Let's remember that second part where God's anger stopped and God's mercy stepped in and God's mercy took the leprosy away and God's mercy put her back inside the camp and God's presence came back down and God began to use him. Let's remember that side. Because I think that side will help those who've not yet fallen realize, I don't want to go down that road. God's mercy was good. But if, God, if I do fall, I know there's a God who's merciful enough, gracious enough to use me. I don't know what you've done. If God can use Alan Domley, he can use you. If God can use Paul, he can use you. If God can use Stephen, he can use you. If God can use all the men in the scriptures, he can use you. His mercy is great enough. It all starts, make Christ your Savior. Accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. And then you always have that access. That no matter what you've done, you can get up. Let's move on. Let's see what God can do through my life. Father.